he hired a brand new sort of royal press advisor, a spin doctor, to whom he handed control of his media operations. Step forward, the then director of the Press Complaints Commission, Mark Boland. Boland, I mean, he was, he was a genius. He was very, very good at what he did. He loved pulling strings, playing with the press. The princes called him Blackadder. Clever, sly, slippery, but a man you could get on with, a man you could ring up, have a lunch with, and actually get some information. I think Mark was very much a background individual. He probably knew as much about the editors of Fleet Street as, as you know, others did about the royal family. And because of these amazing contacts that he had uh, with editors, was able to get their ear. Brilliant manipulator. It was a revolution, because there was this young, openly gay, comprehensive, educated guy coming in and changing all the rules. And Mark Boland certainly had his work cut out. In the wake of Diana's death and all that had gone before, Charles's reputation was in tatters. The stakes could hardly have been higher. Boland would need to establish a new relationship with a sceptical press and to forge, as they say in professional PR circles, a new narrative for his client. The nation was in a state of hysterical grief, but the press's hysteria had veered into psychosis. So Parr announced that he'd be taking me with him on a planned work trip to South Africa. South Africa? Pa? Really? Yes, darling boy. Johannesburg. He had a meeting with Nelson Mandela and the Spice Girls. I was thrilled and baffled. The Spice Girls, Pa? He explained that the Spice Girls were giving a concert in Johannesburg, so they were calling on President Mandela to pay their respects. Great, I thought. That explains why the Spice Girls are going to be there. What about us? I didn't get it. I'm not sure Pa wanted me to get it. The truth was, Pa's staff hoped a photo of him standing alongside the world's most revered political leader and the world's most popular female musical act would earn him some positive headlines, which he sorely needed. Since Mummy's disappearance, he'd been savaged. People blamed him for the divorce and thus for all that followed. His approval rating around the world was single digits. In Fiji, to pick just one example, a national holiday in his honour had been rescinded. Whatever the official reason for the trip, I didn't care. I was just glad to be going along. It was a chance to get away from Britain. Better yet, it was proper time with Pa, who seemed sort of checked out. Not that Pa hadn't always been a bit checked out. He'd always given an air of being not quite ready for parenthood. The responsibilities, the patience, the time. Even he, though a proud man, would have admitted as much. But single parenthood? Pa was never made for that. Pa and I mostly coexisted. He had trouble communicating, trouble listening, trouble being intimate face to face. On occasion, after a long multi-course dinner, I'd walk upstairs and find a letter on my pillow. The letter would say how proud he was of me for something I'd done or accomplished. I'd smile, place it under my pillow, but also wonder why he hadn't said this moments ago, while seated directly across from me. Thus, the prospect of days and days of unrestricted part-time was exhilarating. Then came the reality. This was a work trip for Pa, and for me. The Spice Girls concert represented my first public appearance since the funeral, and I knew, through intuition, through bits of overheard conversations, that the public's curiosity about my welfare was running high. I didn't want to let them down, but I also wanted them all to go away. I remember stepping onto the red carpet, screwing a smile onto my face, suddenly wishing I was in my bed at St. James's Palace. After on the way out, there were more flashes. This time the Spice Girls weren't there to deflect attention. It was just Pa and me. I reached for him, grabbed his hand, hung on. I recall, bright as the flashes, loving him, needing him. Two months after Diana's death and Charles's first foreign engagement, a trip to South Africa. It was an opportunity for Mark Boland to show first the press and then the world a different side to his client's personality. Mark Boland, in a conversation with the Prince, had said it might be an idea to just acknowledge the press and, and just say a few, have a chat with them and just acknowledge it there. And he did. 
He could have just sat at the front in first class and, and done nothing at all, um, which he, he'd done on plenty of other occasions. But on this occasion, he didn't. He came back down. He talked to the press. He made a point of talking to the photographers, the cameramen, the BBC, the dreaded tabloids. That, of course, put all of us in a good mood. It made us feel we were sort of being included for once. It wasn't just them and us. And the whole tour w w carried on like that. The emphasis was very much on a more relaxed, fun-loving Charles, and critically, that new narrative, Charles the Good Father. To wit, the presence of Prince Harry, coincidentally on a half-term break, created PR opportunities galore. It was heaving with people, and uh, I remember his, him coming in, and they had traditional dancers with, you know, topless, you know, ladies, that sort of thing. And the typical little boy sort of looking, look at, looking, looking at this. Because they were laughing and joking away, and it was it, it was just father and son doing what they do best. And the media back home wasn't slow to get the message. In PR terms, the trip was a huge success. Well, I mean, clearly a lot of planning had gone into it, but the thing that people misunderstand, if you like, about the press is that we want a story. And we don't really mind what it is, as long as there's a story. And we know we're being used. We're, we're always being used, especially by, by on royal tours. And this was a good story. So rather than being unnecessarily cynical about it, it gave us an opportunity to, to write about him, to see him as a single parent. And that worked well for him. And the public liked it. It was a recurring theme. A private skiing trip to Canada, yet another photo opportunity, with the well-briefed new narrative still very much to the fore in all the coverage. Diana's death has plunged Prince Charles into the stark modern reality of single parenthood. His sons are his clear priority. Ironically, from the despair and guilt he felt after the princess's death, he's emerged with his image much softened and his popularity higher than it's been for many years. Jenny Bond, BBC News. So far, so good. But was Britain yet ready to accept his relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles? This would be one of Mark Boland's biggest moments. The occasion, a private party to celebrate the 50th birthday of Camilla's sister at the Ritz Hotel in London. I got a call that it was going to happen at the Ritz and I've, I went down there with my ladder and I put the first ladder down. I booked a room overlooking my position, stayed there for two nights. The world would be watching and nothing could be left to chance. There were rumours buzzing around uh, our little network of uh, royal reporters and I, I think it was uh, in a conversation to Mark Bowen and I think I sort of said, I'm going away, I'm going away tonight, you know, is that a good idea? And they sort of said, well, no, probably not, you know? So I immediately said to the news desk, get down to the Ritz! When we got down there, there were loads of people there already, I should have known better. <laughs> There was, I think, 300 yards of photographers and camera crews and sat trucks. And I remember uh, getting a call saying, look, she's very nervous. Says, Can you make sure people don't shout out? I said, look, I'll do that, but you've got to pull the car up the last minute, not have the car there, and they agreed to do that. It was choreographed and it's designed to introduce Camilla to the world. The scene outside the Ritz was complete media overkill. Charles and Camilla had arrived separately, but Boland's big moment would only materialise when they left, together. I was up a stepladder with a pair of binoculars and a microphone doing a sort of live commentary, match of the day type commentary, of this couple coming out the Ritz. Well, very hurriedly down the steps. Uh... Uh, looking sort of bewildered. Side by side, uh, holding each other's hands just briefly. They came down, the car held back, they did that, the car came up, they got him, we all got plenty of pictures. Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of photographs have been taken in these few seconds. Prince Charles and his long-standing companion, Camilla Parker Bowles, have now shown themselves in public as a couple.
Photographers now are rushing to file those photographs so that they will appear in uh, newspapers not only in this country but of course around the world. Another highly significant milestone had been reached in Mark Boland's Operation Mrs. PB. Mark Boland was named the PR Industries Professional of the Year, commended for orchestrating a sea change in his employer's public profile, and even preparing the way for the previously unthinkable, a potential marriage to Camilla Parker Bowles. Inside the firm, however, Boland's methods were starting to cause trouble, as other members of the family found themselves on the wrong end of royal stories that made Charles look good, at least by comparison. Boland's activities were creating collateral damage. There's no question that Mark was prepared to promote the Prince of Wales, and if it dished other members of the royal family, so be it. He made it quite clear that he wasn't bothered about the, the, the other royals. He was only concerned with the Prince of Wales and helping Camilla. He didn't make many friends at Buckingham Palace, but frankly, he didn't care. Do you think at that point someone, this, someone's up to something here? Yeah, totally, yeah, we all did. I mean, it, it, you'd be a fool not to. Two royal insiders who later saw Arden's footage confirmed to me that there was nothing incriminating to be found. But never letting the facts stand in the way of a good story, it soon escalated with reports of what Charles was said to think about his younger brother. Prince Charles is furious. He's phoned his brother three times, demanding an explanation. My recollection is that from uh, within the palace, you know, the palace press officers and people I spoke to there indicated that uh, Charles was extremely unhappy with his uh, younger brother and could not believe that this had happened. The, the language being used at St. James's Palace is irritation, disappointment. You've got to ask, where did the story come from? Why was it spread? And um, how effectively it was done overnight without any calls to us. And it was Daily Mirror editor Piers Morgan who, after a telephone call with his good friend Mark Boland, penned the immortal headline, You f***ing idiot. All the papers carried versions of the story briefed by those same Royal Insider stroke palace sources, amongst them the Daily Mail. Someone obviously told me Charles's personal reaction. I had a reasonably good line of communication into his, into his um, side of, of things at that time. I mean, events had changed. I mean, the mail was no longer the enemy. I mean, Mark Boland had brought a lot of us on board. And I can imagine he would have been like that. I mean, he, he was exasperated by Prince Edward on, on, on many occasions. In any event, Edward's media career was over. 
and Charles appeared as the protective, if indignant, father. It was a message Mark Boland remained keen to reinforce, only this time the story concerned Prince Harry and persistent suggestions of underage drinking and even drug use. Eventually, early in 2002, a sensational story broke about Prince Harry and some of his friends. The story, Prince Harry, underage drinking, smoking cannabis, started here at the Rattlebone Inn in Wiltshire near Highgrove. It found its way onto the front page and seven inside pages of the News of the World, along with a leader which praises the courage of a wise and loving dad. That's a reference to Charles taking Harry to a drug rehab centre to show him the potential error of his ways. So a very bad story for Harry had turned into a very good story for Charles. But is that what actually happened? The story that appeared in the, in the News of the World was not strictly true. It was stories that had been rolled into one to make a better story. The situation was um, the News of the World had been following Harry. Quite a lot of newspapers had been, but uh, Boland was presented by Rebecca Wade with, with this story. This is what they'd got. And he then said, OK, listen, let's, let's come to an arrangement here. And they spun it into a, a good story about Charles, recognising that his son had, had gone off the rails and doing something about it. It is reported that he was uh, confronted by his father, by Prince Charles. As a consequence, Prince Harry went just on one occasion for a couple of hours to a drug rehabilitation centre where he saw uh, uh, heroin addicts and saw the consequences of drug abuse. And that was the line that found its way effortlessly into the public domain. The way that Prince Charles and the Royal Family have handled it is, is, is absolutely right and they've done it in a very responsible and, as you would expect, uh, in a very sensitive way for their child. Mm. This is a very difficult situation. Well, I mean, I know this myself. The visit to the rehab centre had actually happened two months before the News of the World came to Boland with the Rattlebone story. So it was, spun, it was spun as Charles sees trouble brewing with Harry, takes him to the rehab centre, Charles Goodfather, and indeed that's what the News of the World editorial actually said. Exactly. It's, it's about Charles Goodfather. Exactly, absolutely. Uh, when in actual fact the order of events was reversed. The order of events was reversed. So it was a deal. It was a deal. My impression is Harry felt pretty upset about it at the time. It was a wild piece of spin. It didn't happen like that. Harry was asked about the drug story privately. Got this story. Is it true? And he was given a piece of paper with ten accusations they wanted to make. He said every single one of those accusations is a load of rubbish. You know, not here, don't know that guy, never met him, don't know what they're talking about, except that he had done drugs. So at the end of it, the question was, yeah, but have you smoked dope? Yeah, you know, wouldn't give an answer, i.e. the answer is yes. But interesting that the rest of it was effectively complete rubbish. So I think, you know, Harry knew he'd done the wrong thing. He felt very bad about it, he felt he'd let people down, but he also was, I think he was quite angry that the that, that stuff had not happened in the way that had been said. But you know, what choice did he have? He just lived with it.
there were a couple of times where we had some things in. I remember seeing the pictures of William, and then they thought, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no way, no, we can't, we can't use that. But you know, what would happen is the newspapers would have those shots from that one episode and they would use them in, the, in the, that week's papers, but then they'd hang on to them and they'd, they'd chuck them into the paper a couple of weeks later, three weeks after that. So his behaviour is being exaggerated by the way the press Precisely. Was. They'd already written the narrative about Harry. He was the wild child, he was, he was off the rails, the complete antithesis of, of his goody-two-shoes brother. At the end of the day, he was only a teenager, had lost his mum at a very early age, he was rebelling. You know, he wasn't the only one. Prince William was getting drunk quite a lot himself. Nobody seemed to report about that. So there was an image of the good prince and the bad prince, and, and Harry got labelled the bad prince.
book Battle of the Brothers, royal historian Robert Lacey paints a bleak picture of two young men struggling with the demons of their past. Two princes pitted against each other from the start. So many stories out right now focus on Meghan and Megxit, but based on your book, it seems like this rift happened quite some time ago. This story goes right back to the beginning when they were children. And at the age of six, seven, William suddenly starts becoming more serious. He's aware of his destiny as a king. Harry goes in the opposite direction. Do you think that William set Harry up to fail? There is a sense, I think, in which William could be criticized for setting Harry up to fail. It suited the elder brother so well to have the court jester, to have the guy who always carried the blame, both when they were teenagers and now. Lacey contends that Harry was increasingly unhappy in this role. So when he met Meghan, he took the chance to break free. He falls in love with this megawatt woman. He's inspired, he's transformed by her, and he wants more than that. And the palace couldn't handle it. Do you think Meghan was treated unfairly by the palace? There's a clique down there in Buckingham Palace. I think, frankly, you've got it in for Meghan. The couple, Lacey says, became too big for the institution. They were these mega rock stars who, frankly, for the first couple of years, overshadowed William and Kate. Somehow they had to be edged out. And I fear that that is the long term solution that the palace see. The palace sending a message to Harry. Picture is issued of the four monarchs of the present and the future. And I think the underlying message of that is just remember your place, Harry and Meghan. Um, these are the people that really matter in the royal family, and you are the backup, and you're trying to play too prominent a role. The battle between the brothers reaching fever pitch as Harry publicly announces his plans to step down as a senior royal. They explode, um, and they publish their own plans, which they've been planning to release after proper discussion. But Harry lost his cool, he put it out there, the royal family get about 10 minutes notice of what he's going to do, so they lose their cool. William in particular loses his cool. William refusing to even have lunch with Harry before the big meeting at the Queen's Sandringham estate last January, where the couple's future was mapped out. Now living in California, Harry and Meghan have been speaking up on causes important to them without the constraints of the royal family. Lacey argues their departure was grossly mishandled by all and is a great loss to the monarchy. Whenever I was home from school, I hid. I hid in the basement beneath Highgrove, usually with Willie. We called it Club H. Many assumed the H stood for Harry, but in fact, it stood for Highgrove. The basement had once been a bomb shelter. It was windowless, but the brick walls painted bone white kept it from feeling claustrophobic. Also, we kitted out the space with nice pieces from various rural residences. Persian rug. Red Moroccan sofas, wooden table, electric dartboard. We also put in a huge stereo system. It didn't sound great, but it was loud. In a corner stood a drinks trolley, well stocked, thanks to creative borrowing, so there was always a faint aroma of beer and other booze. Willie and I would start a typical weekend evening by sneaking into a nearby pub where we'd have a few drinks, a few pints of snake bite, then round up a group of mates and bring them back to Club H. There were never more than 15 of us though somehow there were never less than 15 either. Names float back to me. Badger, Casper, Nisha, Lizzie, Skippy, Emma, Rose, Olivia, Chimp, Pell. We all got on well, and sometimes a bit more than well. There was plenty of innocent snogging, which went hand in hand with the not-so-innocent drinking. Rum and Coke, or vodka, usually in tumblers, with liberal splashes of Red Bull. We were often tipsy, and sometimes smashed, and yet, there wasn't a single time that anyone used or brought drugs down there. Our bodyguards were always nearby, which kept a lid on things. But it was more than that. We had a sense of boundaries. Club H was the perfect hideout for a teenager, but especially this teenager. When I wanted peace, Club H provided. When I wanted mischief, Club H was the safest place to act out. When I wanted solitude, what better than a bomb shelter in the middle of the British countryside? At the tail end of 2001, Marco visited me at Eton. We met for lunch at a cafe in the heart of town, which I thought quite a treat. Plus an excuse to bunk off. Leave school grounds? I was all smiles. But no, 
Marco, looking grim, said this was no larky outing. What's up, Marco? I've been asked to find out the truth, Harry. About what? I suspected he was referring to my recent loss of virginity. Inglorious episode with an older woman. She liked horses quite a lot and treated me not unlike a young stallion. Quick ride, after which she'd smacked my rump and sent me off to graze. Among the many things about it that were wrong, it happened in a grassy field behind a busy pub. Obviously someone had seen us. The truth, Marco? About whether or not you're doing drugs, Harry. What? It seemed that the editor of Britain's biggest tabloid had recently phoned my father's office to say she'd uncovered evidence of me doing drugs in various locations, including Club H. Also a bike shed behind a pub. Not the pub where I'd lost my virginity. My father's office immediately dispatched Marco to take a clandestine meeting with one of this editor's lieutenants in some shady hotel room and the lieutenant laid out the tabloid's case. Now Marco laid it out for me. He asked again if it was true. Lies, I said, all lies. He went item by item through the editor's evidence. I disputed all of it. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The basic facts, the details, it was all wrong. I then questioned Marco. Who the hell is this editor? Loathsome toad, I gathered. Everyone who knew her was in full agreement that she was an infected pustule on the arse of humanity plus a shit excuse for a journalist. But none of that mattered, because she'd managed to wriggle her way into a position of great power, and lately, she was focusing all that power upon me. She was hunting the spare, straight out, and making no apologies for it. She wouldn't stop until my balls were nailed to her office wall. I was lost, for doing basic teenage stuff, Marco? No, boy, no. In this editor's estimation, Marco said, I was a drug addict. A what? And one way or another, Marco said, that was the story she was going to publish. I offered a suggestion about what this editor could do with her story. I told Marco to go back, tell her she had it all wrong. He promised he would. He rang me days later, said he'd done what I asked, but the editor didn't believe him. And she was now vowing not only to get me, but to get Marco. Surely, I said, Pa will do something. Stop her. Long silence. No, Marco said. Pa's office had decided on a different approach. Rather than telling the editor to call off the dogs, the palace was opting to play ball with her. They were going full Neville Chamberlain. Did Marco tell me why? Or did I learn only later that the guiding force behind this putrid strategy was the same spin doctor Pa and Camilla had recently hired, the same spin doctor who'd leaked the details of our private summits with Camilla? This spin doctor, Marco said, had decided that the best approach in this case would be to spin me, right under the bus. In one swoop, this would appease the editor and also bolster the sagging reputation of Pa. Amid all this unpleasantness, all this extortion and gamesmanship, the spin doctor had discovered one silver lining, one shiny consolation prize for Pa. No more the unfaithful husband Pa would now be presented to the world as the harried single dad coping with a drug-addled child. I went back to Eton, tried to put all of this out of my mind, tried to focus on my schoolwork, tried to be calm. I listened over and over to my go-to soothing CD, Sounds of the Okavango. Forty tracks. Crickets, baboons, rainstorm, thunder, birds, lions and hyenas scrapping over a kill. At night, shutting off the lights, I'd hit play. My room sounded like a tributary of the Okavango. It was the only way I could sleep. After a few days, the meeting with Marco receded from consciousness. It began to feel like a nightmare. But then I woke to the actual nightmare. A blaring front-page headline, Harry's Drugs Shame. January 2002. Spread over seven pages inside the newspaper, were all the lies Marco had presented to me, and many more. The story not only had me down as a habitual drug user, it had me recently going to rehab. Rehab? The editor had got her mitts on some photos of Marco and me paying a visit to a suburban rehab center months earlier, a typical part of my princely charitable work, and she'd repurposed the photos, made them visual aids for her libelous fiction. I gazed at the photos and read the story in shock. I felt sickened, horrified. 
I imagined everyone, all my countrymen and countrywomen, reading these things, believing them. I could hear people all across the Commonwealth gossiping about me. Crikey, the boy's a disgrace. Oh, his poor dad, after all he's been through? More, I felt heartbroken at the idea that this had been partly the work of my own family, my own father and future stepmother. They'd abetted this nonsense. For what? To make their own lives a bit easier? I phoned Willie. I couldn't speak. He couldn't either. He was sympathetic. And more. Raw deal, Harold. At moments he was even angrier about the whole thing than I was, because he was privy to more details about the spin doctor and the backroom dealings that had led to this public sacrifice of the spare. And yet, in the same breath, he assured me that there was nothing to be done. This was Pa. This was Camilla. This was royal life. This was our life. I phoned Marco. He too offered sympathy. I asked him to remind me, what was this editor's name? He said it, and I committed it to memory. But in the years since then, I've avoided speaking it, and I don't wish to repeat it here. Spare the reader, but also myself. Besides, can it possibly be a coincidence that the name of the woman who pretended I went to rehab is a perfect anagram for rehab a kooks? Is the universe not saying something there? Who am I not to listen? Over several weeks, newspapers continued to rehash the rehabber Cook's libels, along with various new and equally fabricated accounts of goings-on in Club H. Our fairly innocent teenage clubhouse was made to sound like Caligula's bedchamber. Loch Mick was a favourite haunt for Queen Victoria. The prince and his children often come here with friends of the family. Do you like being with your children? Of course I do. I, I don't know whether they like being with me. But um, what is marvellous is to see them develop and, and you know, start to get good at certain things and develop interests and all that. You know, it gives me enormous pleasure. And, um, Satisfaction and pride. Really. Oh, horrendous ball. Hang on. Oh, he's going to be a substitution Prince's two sons are like other children, except that they're quite different. They will inherit privileges and duties which will test them to the limit. Their father believes that they will need one quality above all. Sensitivity to others, which by any definition is actually called good manners, which I think a lot of people have forgotten. And also, on the whole, do to others as you'd have them do to you, which is not a bad way of trying to operate. The prince looks forward to their teenage years. Brilliant. As they get older, there are more things that perhaps they, being boys, they could do with their father. And, um, I mean, that's, you know, obviously more and more enjoyable. 